Let the bodies hit the floor. 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 It's the Waiting for Next Year dot com podcast. My name is Dave Sterling. With me live in person, Chris Clem. What's up, Dave? Oh, you know, just hanging out. We just finished watching some YouTube. Oh yeah. Just like we were at a sleepover. It's been a lot of fun, popcorn. Do you think that kids these days do that? What do they do at sleepovers now? Like Fortnite. Is it Fortnite? I don't know. My sleepover years, a lot of GoldenEye sixty four. Um, when I was at like the more group oriented ones. And then whenever I stayed at a friend's house, you know, we'd play two player games for a while and then I'd get tired and just, and say, Hey, you play one of those role playing games, like a fantasy star four. And then he would play that. And then I'd fall asleep. Uh, I would say, yeah, middle school, a little younger would be like uh Nintendo 64, I guess I'd be 12. Uh, yeah, so that kind of stuff. Then Smash Brothers, a bit older. Yeah, I I never, never got into the like either the Smash Brothers or like the Mario Party. Like I never oh, was around those in when high they were. School, we played Mario Party all the time. I feel like I missed something there with that. We would compete with it because I got I got into uh, the like my favorite Nintendo system, other than obviously the sixty four was the GameCube, because that's when they were just like, hey, let's have Mario and his pals do all sorts of activities and hobbies. They were even in hobbies. Uh, NBA Street. Were they? Yep. Wow. In the GameCube version. Uh, so I really enjoyed Mario uh, All-Stars Soccer. Okay. And I also... Oh, that was Mario Strikers. Sorry. So yeah, Strikers. I also really enjoyed the uh, Mario baseball oh, for the game slugger Cube. super sluggers or whatever yeah that yeah, was i got it for wii with the the motion control Ooh. added that sounds fun it's the exact same game you just swing it i really like that game because it, it's much like all the good mario games well the soccer one wasn't like this but like the good mario games it's kind of half rpg half half sports game so you would recruit players yeah beat beat uh other teams and win challenges during the games so i built a pretty good lineup yeah I, you don't, you don't want to get stuck with the koopa troopa in ugh. every outfield position yeah i know or the, goomba they don't even have hands yeah i know i would always start with the uh the wario team oh, okay and then i would i would use waluigi as my pitcher and then i think you got uh it's basically a randy johnson type well, really, it was Andrew Miller. Oh, yeah. Which, just tall, lanky, weird throwing motion. Current reference. Yeah, ki- high kick. Uh, but you'd get, what's the name of the ghosts? Boo. Boo. And King Boo was on your team, too. He's a big home run hitter. So, basically, the strategy is you start out with Wario. Then you go and take on probably Mario first. You recruit Mario and Luigi to your team. And then then you're just unstoppable. Your your idea is to get the main guys onto your lineup and get the lesser characters out of there as soon as you can. They're like the DiMaggio brothers. Right. Italians were at one point <laughs> our greatest baseball players. At one point. Yeah. Uh, party in Napoli. He holding the tradition down for yeah. Italians. Um yeah. Uh I have a GameCube emulator that stopped working on my computer. So I was able to play that baseball game for a while. And then the swing timing was slightly different than I remember it. So I was terrible at it for a while. And then I kind of figured it out. That's my biggest problem with the Switch. Playing the classic games on the Switch is the the button timing. Which games? I uh, Basically Mario 1 and Mario 3. Oh, the NES ones. Yeah, so you're... you're you have several years of muscle memory of what your thumb speed should be on the button, and it's just not the same timing. Do you have a a game mode on your TV you can turn on? I don't know. 
That'll usually reduce the lag. Mm. Well, it's even when I'm playing it on the the screen of the Switch. I think it's just oh, the, really? the button has a different uh, spot where the, the Switch connects. Not the Switch, the, the device, the, the Switch in the button. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I found myself falling down a lot of pits in uh, Mario. Do you think one. that uh, maybe it's not the controller's fault and you're just not as good? Could be. 100% could be. It's been a long time. Uh, I will say after playing Mario World uh, most of my uh, life that it's very hard to get used to the physics of the first Mario Brothers game. Yeah, they're a little off. Yeah. What I've also found is all of those games, you're used to playing them on the controller that the system was designed for. And so basically, once we got to a certain point, most controllers are either like a PlayStation controller or an Xbox controller now, but like the Super Nintendo with Super Mario World, they built, well, yeah, you got to use these two buttons we put on the controller because this is the game that we give you with the system. So yeah, let me show you how to use these buttons. The Super NES uh, face button layout has basically been adopted by every controller since. Other than when the 64 came out and there's an analog stick. So that's the toughest one for me is... I got an N64 emulator. I was playing Super Mario. uh, What is it? It's not 3D. 64? Yeah, Mario 64. The best game of all time. And it's just, wait a minute. I'm used to the stick being in the middle. You you can get USB Nintendo 64 like replica controllers. Yeah, it's probably like one of those Mad Cats ones that I got, junk anyway. I, I mean, I got one from the exchange, and it looks like since the patent expired, they just basically use the exact same mold. Oh, all right. Well. I haven't used it yet, though. I'm trying to think. I'd probably get a GameCube controller, really, because that all my favorite games are on the game. Other than Mario 64 is so good. I've just had a problem. I have Mario 64 on my Wii U, and... Uh, it works fine, but like Star Fox 64, there's not enough buttons because so they used all the face buttons, for uh, those C buttons. So you have to use the stick, and it just doesn't work right. Yeah. Never got into Star Fox as much. It's fun because you could beat it in like 40 minutes, and then it's like <laughs> trying to go back and do better. I was thinking about that. Somebody at work today was whistling the menu theme from Super Mario 3, mm-hmm. and I was thinking about it, and everybody knew the strategy of okay you get the the two warp whistles right away in super mario 3 and then you beat the first ship and then the castle so you get to level two then you can warp to world seven then you can warp to world eight and i wonder how much nintendo planned on people skipping 80 percent of their game um actually they've talked about it because they used to have a feature on their website called iwata ass back when uh satoru iwata was still uh kicking and uh nintendo president he'd interview their old developers and stuff and they put that in there uh the same reason why it was in the first mario brothers was because you couldn't save the game (laughs) so they wanted you to be able to get back to the further levels like when you Mm. picked it back up that's a really smart idea to get around not being able to save a game. Yeah, it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Like, okay, so if I get this whistle, I can at least go back to World 4 or wherever. Everybody wants to go to Giant Land. Yeah. And nobody wants to go to the desert one where that angry sun is chasing you. Like, I'm skipping that one. I like to skip the Pipe Kingdom, whatever that's called. Oh, anyone that had the auto-scrolling, I did not like. Let me go at my own pace. So you didn't like Skyland? No. Anything where it was a jump, jump timing based. That level where you got to jump on all the flying Koopa Troopas and then yeah. you like dip down and then float back up. Yeah, and then there's the ones where you step on the block and the block falls every time. Mm-hmm. They look like little candies. Yeah, did not like those. Do you ever play with a sibling, a sibling or anything, or a friend where they would like go out of their way when it was their turn and go back to the level you're on and play like the Mario Brothers mini game? Yeah, yeah. Well, that they would do it so they could go to the Toad's house. Yeah. Or to play the card game. 
It's like, that's a low-down trick. Shitty. It's like, oh, I want to fight this Hammer Brother. <laughs> All right, so now I'm just singing Mario music. Uh, Go for it, Dave. All right. Can you uh, do the athletic theme for Mario Brothers 3? The athletic theme. You actually just were doing it. What? The... Oh. Um, I think uh, the most iconic Mario music is obviously the first one, but all the games have really good music. Yeah, they really do. It's very interesting when you kind of learn about those developer tools because each system then has its own kind of distinct language because well, these are the instruments that they provided to you. Mm -hmm. So um, growing up, when I was in middle school, I had a friend who had a Super Nintendo and a Genesis, which... You know, back in those days, that's pretty big time. Um, so, yeah, I always remember the, the very distinct uh, Genesis instruments versus the very distinct Super Nintendo instruments. Also, he later got a Sega CD. And we found that if you put the Sega CD into a regular CD player... As long as you skipped track one, which was the data track, and made an awful, awful noise, all the songs and dialogue from the game were just tracks further down this CD. Because it was all Red Book audio. Right. Uh, you know, it's funny. The Sega CD had, like, actual recorded songs on the CD and stuff. But I think nowadays people don't really appreciate the Genesis that much because the Super NES had such a nice sound chip and distinct noise. Yeah. That n I thought it sounded better as a kid, but as an adult, it's like it makes the Genesis seem like a much, much worse piece of technology because the mu sound and music is just not even comparable. It's, it's yeah, it's the the music can be okay. Yeah. But when the the effects sound like it's from an Atari yeah. Like all the sound effects, other than maybe Streets of Rage 2. Like you listen to, as much as I like the music, like the Sonic the Hedgehog music versus something like the Donkey Kong Country oh, games. Yeah. And it sounds like listening to like an eight track versus yeah. a streaming. Someone got a Casio thing. keyboard to yeah. hit the demo button. Yeah. It's like. <laughs> I also, uh, since we're talking about this, I just maybe wasted a hundred dollars <laughs> uh so i've been looking for i'll determine whether or not okay. it was a waste i've been looking for a virtual boy in a sega saturn because i like kind of collect old systems i don't really i i just started out having like oh i had a super nintendo and then i had a nintendo 64 and then it's like then i got uh when i was a little bit older i ended up with the genesis and then the playstation which i don't even have because it wasn't mine but anyways so i just ended up with all these old systems and I really wanted to get a Virtual Boy because it was the only Nintendo system I didn't have. Yeah. I really wanted to get a Sega Saturn because I'd never seen one of them at any store ever before. The Saturn was the just the console after the Genesis? Yes. And it was a huge flop in America. And if anybody is actually interested in what we're talking about, there's a book called The Console Wars, which came out about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And it describes the battle between sega and nintendo in the 90s and why the saturn was such a huge flop it was basically because nintendo of japan was jealous of the success nintendo of america had and basically ignored their suggestions and the things they had come up with and do something on their own which did not work whatsoever for america it's a very interesting story about hmm. the politics between international corporations one international corporation would have huge branches in different sides of the world anyways saturn the exchange said they'd have one coming up this month. And I said, call me, please, when it comes. <laughs> it was 100 bucks. If you go on like eBay, you can get a Japanese Saturn for about 50 bucks, But American ones go from between 70 to $200, just depending on the time. So I'm like, 100 bucks is fine. I'll pay that. And they called me, and I was here. So I asked my wife. Well, I actually asked. I got to <laughs> hold it. till. I'm like, I won't be there till Thursday. This was Sunday. And he's like, well, I can't hold it that long. He's like, I can hold it to like Tuesday. And I said, are you serious? You can't just hold it two more days? I'm yeah, it's two you more days. I mean, are you going to get a better offer on yeah. it? Like, So I, I asked my wife to pick it up, and she picked it up for me and paid for it. And then she goes, 
hey, uh, while I'm here, do you want me to get any games for you? And I said, yeah, I would love to have some games for it because I don't have any to play on it. Yeah. So she went there, and they, they literally had two games. Mega Man 8 in the package still, still shrink-wrapped, that was selling for $500, which is extra funny because clearly it was bought in, like, the late 90s when they were just liquidating all their Saturn stuff. <laughs> yeah. It was, like, the price tag on it is something like $9 or something. It's under 15 bucks. And then the other game they had was Panzer Dragoon Saga, which was seven hundred and fifty dollars. And she's like, "I'm sorry, you're not I, getting any games for this." Yeah, that's a lot of money. Well, I, the, I guess that's the most wanted game for the system, Panzer Dragoon. It's very rare because it was at the end of the system's life cycle and it wasn't popular in America. And the Mega Man one is just because it's still wrapped, so all those games are really expensive. But you could probably eBay those games way cheaper, right? Maybe. Uh, Panzer Dragoon, probably. Mega Man, I, I have no interest in it. It's on like a compilation. I already yeah. played it. I, I, I well, if you played Mega Man 1, you've played that. Game. Yeah. This the because only all the Mega is, Mans are the same. It has a, a sprites that are like the size of the screen. Sorry, Mega games. Man fans, <laughs> but Mega Mans are all the same. But uh, I went on eBay, and I can get 20 games for 75 bucks, but they're all like madden 96 or like see i like playing the old madden the nba are... 96 i if i could get nba jam extreme I'll, I'll buy that well i think it's funny because you you would come across the right garage sale and you could buy it for 50 cents yeah like you get the wrong person's mom who just goes you know what i'm i'm tired of this i'm taking craig's stuff and i'm putting it in a box and i'm selling it for 50 cents so craig if you're out there listening which who knows you might be just let Chris have your Sega Saturn games. He has Sega Saturn games? I don't know. I'm just a hypothetical at this point. I would have thought he got rid of them when he started running. That's true. That was his reward for running is that he could ditch those games finally. He's like, I don't need this copy of Clockwork Knight. <laughs> uh, remember? Uh, or Bug. I'm trying to think of the late, some of my favorite late original Nintendo games. But, like, late in the console where they're kind of pushing it. There's one on Switch that I never played when it came out. It's called Wario's Woods, and it's not even that good. It's just, like, a basic puzzle game. But I found myself playing it for probably about eight hours nonstop. Do they add Do they add new? T I haven't turned on my Switch in a little while. Yeah, they add new ones each month. Oh, cool. Because I, I think I'm paying for that still, even though I don't use it you very often. You pay for it each month? Or you can, the, it's I, 20 I mean, bucks a year. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Like, yeah. I pa I've paid for it twice now. But it's like, yeah. It's that's my favorite part of it is I'll go and oh, I'll, yeah. I'll play three quarters of a tech mobile game and then I'll stop. But like <laughs> even those, the the Tecmo basketball. Yeah. The end of the Nintendo was pretty damn deep game for a Nintendo. Kirby's Adventures on the Switch one. And that's probably the system that or the game that pushed the system the most in terms of graphics. Then you've got your... Uh, it's also the only hard Kirby game. Or the <laughs> only Kirby game that's not the easiest game ever. <laughs> I've never really played a lot of Kirby games. Like, they tried to get everybody into Kirby. Yeah, he's popular, and they're fun, but they're fun because I played it for the first time when I was, like, five. And Kirby's Adventure, seriously, is the only one that won't just bore you to death because it's so easy. I got Kirby Return to Dreamland, which was a four-player game. My friend came over. We are playing it. It's only, like, six hours long. Me, him, and my wife were playing it. We beat half the game, and he's like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> and he just put it down, and I've never played the game since. It, huh. was, it was that easy. There's no challenge whatsoever. It's not fun. It's just you have to push buttons in a certain order mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. that's I, I remember uh, I didn't have it, but uh, my friend had, well, Dan Holmes. Had, oh. Had uh, the man mutu himself. mutual Facebook friend. He and his brother played the Tecmo basketball, but that was, that would have been early nineties when the Cavs were good. Yeah. I don't remember if Michael Jordan was in that or not, I or if he was he just player 23 because he had his own separate, he wasn't a part of the NBA players association licensing deal. Right. You had to pony up the cash to get him. Yeah. And then Shaq did the same thing. I remember what was the one, uh, double dribble, mm -hmm. the basketball game that you could punch in. Yeah. Arch Rivals. Oh, that was that one. Double Dribble was a Double different Dribble one. Double Dribble was... No, you could still do that. It was basically like... A Arch Rivals is the one I'm that, thinking of. Yeah, that's the one where it was heavy emphasis on combat. Well, 
not the heaviest emphasis on combat because that would fall to Bill Lambeer's combat basketball. <laughs> I knew I was waiting for that. You knew I knew Phil, Bill Lambeer's combat oh, basketball. Yeah. I remember the TV commercials for Bill Lambeer's combat combat basketball. Like, like they were very heavy on these these dumb games where you don't get to punch people. How about basketball in the future with armor? Uh, I wish that Rick Mahorn was the only other NBA player in that game. That would have been something. <laughs> That was kind of a golden age, too. We had uh, another Dan Holmes had. Uh, he had a game that was called Quattro Sports, wow. which was an unlicensed game. <laughs> like, you know like how Super all of the Noah's Ark, like, you know, all the games that they say, oh, under license from Nintendo. This one was not. It was Tengen, right? Yeah. And there was a switch on the back and it said, if it doesn't work, go to switch B. See if that works. But yeah, there was it, it was soccer, baseball, tennis, and golf all on one cartridge, and we used to play the soccer game a lot. Did he have like rich parents or something? Just pretty standard parents. Why those? He's got a lot of games you keep mentioning. Well, there's like four. I mean, man, when I was a kid, this probably is why I do stupid things like buying a hundred dollar Saturn. I had one system. I had a Super Nintendo, and then I had a Nintendo sixty four. It was it. And I would get a game if I was lucky on Christmas, and maybe if something was really cheap on sale for my birthday. That'd yeah, be it. see, I I was we were uh, we were kind of a, a computer house, so I asked for a Nintendo one year, and I think I got an Atari twenty six hundred because it was half the price of a Nintendo, and a hundred bucks in the late eighties was a lot of goddamn money. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I understood. I had fun with the Atari 2600. I got to have it in my room and, you know, stuff like that. And then... uh, Got your fill of Pitfall. Oh, yeah. Plenty of Pitfall. Some of the worst Pac-Man game ever. Um, But I I like that tank game on the Atari 2600. Those are legitimately fun. fun. You could play against somebody. Yeah. Um, Anyway, but then, like, a couple years later, um, we got a computer... It was an Atari ST computer, which ran a very, very weird. I don't even. It had its own operating system. It was very kind of similar to I'm like actually, a Mac. I'm familiar with that computer because my grandma had one at her house. Yeah. So, um, but that I played some games that were actually really fun. There was a, a really fairly deep soccer game called Sensible Soccer that was kind of just this top down soccer game that uh, had, like, a full World Cup and all this stuff. I would play that game a lot. But the most fun, and they haven't really done this since, is when you started the game, you could play either outdoor, and all of the teams were, like, countries of the world, like the World Cup. Or if you switched it to indoor, then they were all, like, American cities. But you could play indoor with walls and stuff like that. And there has not been – FIFA had it one year. But it wasn't the curved walls either. It was just walls on a square, like futsal court. But this, that was the most fun. It was top down. Yeah. My favorite Atari computer game was they had a gauntlet game for it that was actually very faithful to the original arcade. Hmm. It was pretty fun. My dad was into Silent Service, the submarine game. Oh, okay. And he always would try to do like the hardest scenario. Like, it was all based on, like, real World War II battles. So he would do one where you were one sub up against a fleet of, like, six different ships, and he'd lose almost instantly. <laughs> Not instantly, but, like, he would lose every time. But he's like, I'm going to try this one again. Like, well, why don't you try one of the ones you could? No, no, I'm going to try this one. And then, yeah. I wonder, see, in my mind, the graphics were so vivid and perfect but I then, mean, they were really good for the time. They honestly... Yeah, were. The, that Atari ST was a very powerful computer for its day, and I bet it was pretty damn expensive when it came out. I can't... I was playing on it like 12, not 12, but like maybe 12 years after it came out. So it was much... It was very old at that time. But it still was held up graphically not too bad. Um and booting things up off those discs was pretty fun. Yeah. Because nobody gets that now. But, yeah, you ha- booting off the discs. But, yeah, and it had this weird, like, green desktop. Oh, yeah. 
I, I'm telling you, I might be the only person that listens to this that would have, and obviously I'm speaking to you, that has any memory of this whatsoever. Some people might be like, oh, I was into the Amiga or Apple II or yeah, whatever. Yeah, see, people gave but me this Amiga nonsense. What does this look like? London? Yeah. So this is the funny thing is... Oh, I have my Spectrum 64. So it came oh, out in, in 1985. My cousin had a Commodore 64. Okay, but we those had, were really popular overseas, but yeah. more than here. And so he had a lot of great games for that. But, again, they were all kind of – it was funny. Like, he had a lot of games. Like, we were trying to come up with games we could play and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, yeah, well, I got this basketball one. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's see that. And I'm expecting, like, this awesome ba- – but it was like a text basketball game. So it would tell you what was happening, and then you'd have to tell it what to do. And it's like, why? who would want to do this? So with a color monitor, the Atari ST was $1,000. Okay. Which, when you compare it to a $100 Nintendo, but uh, that's pretty pretty impressive. And the problem is with that is, uh, I wouldn't say the better, but I am probably more of a fan of most of, the, of that era of the Japanese developers. Uh, so I would say like the Nintendo games are more fun to yeah. this day. Yeah, yeah. No, they had the. I'm trying to think of the Atari ST games we had, but I know we had Silent Service, which was the submarine game. We had Test Drive, um, which became a big series yeah. later. Um, but I'm just, they were all kind of more, not necessarily simulation based, but they weren't like they're not action. The only game games. that was for other things that we had on the atari st was zevious i don't know if you remember that game it was you were flying a little ship oh yeah and so that one we had and was like oh yeah because it was an arcade game i think so this was like a port of the arcade version and you could play that and i was like oh yeah i got zevious that's one you know yeah but for the most part it was games you hadn't heard of and but nobody's like man have you ever played uh mario brothers 3 no no but i played silent service no but i've tried to get some japanese subs to sing (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah the um even like games like castlevania which are very dated are still very fun to go back and play yeah it turns out they were just trying to make them as fun as possible yeah. and there was later we got into you know regular pcs and stuff like that and then i was do you ever play any of the lucas arts games oh uh very much so the like the point and click adventure games. Yeah, yes. yeah. So full throttle. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, that I remember one. that, and I remember we, I was very young, and my friend had a Mac, and he had the the whole set of the Lucas Art adventure games, nice. and we thought it was hilarious because it was slightly edgy. Oh yeah, Sam and Max. What are they going to oh, say Sam next? Sam and Max. Oh, he just almost swore. <laughs> uh, one interesting thing: if you're terribly bored, and you want to go down a YouTube wormhole, pretty much. The best part of a LucasArts game is you don't have to play the game for it to be just as interesting as it was. So you can watch a playthrough of Full Throttle on YouTube, and it's just as fun as playing it because the clicking wasn't the fun part. Yeah, but you still, you're still you not solving the puzzle then. That's true. There was one super annoying puzzle in Full Throttle where you had to click the right thing at the right time. And like everything else was actually solvable, and this one was like, oh, you have to kick the wall at the right time. So I played the Back to the Future game that came out about probably even at this point, like eight years ago. It's an adventure game, but I played for it on Wii. So it was like point with the Wii Mm, cursor. Yeah. Um, And it was very, the puzzles were really, some of them were really hard, but it was smart and you could figure out the answer. You didn't have to like look up hints or whatever because they weren't completely obtuse. And then I was like, man, I forgot how much fun point and click adventure games were. And I went back and started playing old games. And there was one called Under, I think it's Under a Steel Sky. That game was amazing, and uh, I played through it. It was like I didn't know what happened to time, and I stayed up like the entire <laughs> night, and I'm like, it's been 16 hours, and I just finished this whole game. So I, I was really getting back into them, and I heard that Grim Fandango was one of the best adventure games ever, and it was on the Switch shop on sale for 3 bucks. So I'm like, oh, I've always wanted to play this. Yeah. So I'm going to get it. And it... The way the puzzles are set up, your character, there's ones where 
you can figure out exactly what the solution is. And I'm like, this is what I'm trying to do. And I'll spend 10 minutes trying to do it. Just I'll, execute the commands. Yeah. And I look up how to do it. And it says, this is what you do. And then apparently my character, because it was like a controllable thing, not just a point and click one. You like physically interacted with the environment like a regular adventure game, like a Zelda or something. Mm-hmm. And it, my guy wasn't three pixels in the right direction. So it was unsolvable. Uh. So it was very frustrating. So those kind of games, definitely, if you some of the ports are better than others, yeah, yeah, just watch the YouTube thing because they are incredibly frustrating. Yeah, Uh, Maniac Mansion. I don't know if you remember that one. Night of the Tentacle. Yeah, yeah, it's a sequel. Yeah, I, I, I think I own that on Steam. What about Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis? I've never played that one. I bought a game for the Wii recently, so it was very cheap because. (laughs) An unlockable in it is uh, Fate of Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the other. Full Throttle was probably my favorite one. They're all the scum was like the name of the system they used for it. Or yeah, yeah. Engine. Yeah. And then that guy did Full Throttle, Tim Schafer. He's still making games to this day. He did Grim Fandango. And then eventually, uh, once Lucas Film got sold and they broke up Lucas Arts, he went and founded his own company. Hmm. Do you ever get into the simulation games? Not so much. I've played some of them, but it's just too. I was a kid, and it's just too boring for me. I got I got into Railroad Tycoon, uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon. Oh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, yeah. Who everybody everybody did, yeah. yeah. And then then you got into the world where they just made every sort of tycoon game, and they're all dumb. I I had some lady recently tell me like one of the most arrogant conversations <laughs> I've ever had in my entire life. And she was telling me that her kid was gifted and that uh, she was trying to get him into gifted programs and that he's just so bright and he's such a genius and he spends all of his days making roller coaster designs. And she's like, oh, I'm boring. You don't know anything about gifted programs. And I was doubly insulted because I was like, I was in them my whole childhood. And secondly, every kid between the age of like 40 and 27 spent a lot of time designing roller coasters because of the game Roller Coaster Tycoon. And it turns out they made the system pretty simple to do. It's not hard. It It's always going to like, the you know, the hard part of actual roller coaster design is making sure it doesn't fall over yeah. and making sure no one's going <laughs> to die and making sure you've put enough support under yeah. the the G loads going sideways that the wheels you picked for the bottom of it aren't going to have it come apart. Like that just doodling in a room. Like I want three loops. (laughs) It turns out that it's a lot more simplified. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I guess the point of the story is don't be that kind of parent. No, I actually, it was funny. I think it's kind of funny because if you ask everyone, they say, Oh yeah, my, my child's gifted and stuff like that. And that's the thing, too. She's like, the school system doesn't believe me. These people, I've, I've taken them and tested. They keep saying he's not. And I was like, if you're doing this for this long <laughs> time, the answer is he's not. He's not. And that's where I made a joke shortly after my daughter was born. Yeah, she's not gifted. <laughs> and then my mom was like, what? I'm like, it's a joke because everyone says, like, first yeah. of all, at the time, she was like two months old. Like, she's not doing anything. But anyway, and and yeah, you're right. Every parent thinks their child is so bright. It's like every person who has a dog is like, my dog is the smart. Right. Oh, my dog can get around these fences. Oh, they're oh so smart. boy. And I get it. Your kid, you make it. You. Th- my kid is the cutest kid in the universe. That is my universe. Exactly. And I'm a hundred percent willing to admit that. And it, you know what? If your kid's not gifted, so what? They yeah, still can great. be a great person. They can still contribute quite a bit to society. I bet Hitler was pretty gifted. Yeah. <laughs> he ended up to be Hitler. Exactly. You hear that, Craig? <laughs> I don't know why I invoked Craig's name you right after that? Hitler. <laughs> Craig, you are... <laughs> you might be Hitler. You could be. Gifted Hitler would be an excellent band name. That would be. <laughs> you probably would get... I don't know. I think that'd probably be a bad idea at this point in time. It probably at this point in time. It sounds way too pro Hitler. Yeah, that's true. I'd like to go on record and say I'm 100% anti Hitler. I am. Uh, I would agree. Do we have to do that at this point? I would do do it to be safe, and I wouldn't say I agree because maybe they'll splice me out of it. So I would that's say true. it for yourself you as well. You could say I 100% agree. 
Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Craig has the technology that he's he going to splice it out and ruin you. He's going to... You're I agree, Hitler mitigate. <laughs> the uh, he's going to use his social media powers, and the Dave Sterling, Chris Clum, WFMI podcasts will be canceled. Oh man, can he do that? He could cancel us, man. He just gets the outrage mob. How many? How many followers? Does For, he have? First of all, he's going to get some plates banned from Macy's. Well, he's got six thousand. 600 followers damn he he's could, yeah. he's almost to the point where he can swipe up oh my god you're right he just needs 3400 more uh oh. tonight i learned that you have to be at a certain follower count to be able to do the swipe up on instagram it's quite upsetting i i just want to put links to unrelated things and i guess that's why you have to have a lot of followers because they don't want you to just be uh, i guess what would be the 2019 version of rick rolling somebody I guess, but I would think that someone who has a lot of followers is more likely to rickroll someone than anybody else. I just don't get it. Why can't I put links? I want to say swipe up and then go to like the stats for Larry Kettner's 99 season. Sure. I'm, I would say I would want to uh, swipe up and have it be the Amazon link for like the smallest instant pot. Exactly. Why not? Why not? What if I want you to have an Instant Pot? I want to swipe up and just have it be a website that's a picture of Mitchell Butler, and it says, Remember Me. <laughs> I want to have a swipe up, which is just that Time Cube website. Do you remember Time Cube? Uh-huh. And just have people read up on the Time Cube. I just want to have it swipe up and be the Chagrin Cinema's <laughs> Lindell Insurance <laughs> Night. I just want to swipe up and have it be my old GeoCities page. Oh, man. I, you just threw me off. I can't even, like, make another joke. I'm just thinking <laughs> of all the old free websites I used to have. My I had Angel an, Fire. I had an site. Angel Fire. I had Tripod by Lycos. I did have Tripod after Angel Fire got a little tough to deal with. Um, remember when you needed to find your own image storage to host your images? Yep. Now, I was on... Um, I was an early adopter, so I was angelfire.com slash OH slash. I was not OH2. Whew. OH slash virtual waffles was my uh, website. I had a huge website at hometown.aol.com nice. slash Uncle Fizil. Nice. And then they sent me an email like seven years ago that said they're taking all of them down, and it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, that stinks. Mine was called Dave's Little Nook of Cyberspace. Really? Had a lot of animated GIFs on there. I I mean, I was like that. I typed it all out by hand in HTML. Oh, yeah. And I added, like, terrible MIDI files that auto-played oh, yeah. every time <laughs> you open the page. The best part, and I remember, like, almost dying on this hill. Number one, you had to put the little thing at the bottom that said, coded in notepad. Like, Fuck you and your software that makes this even reasonably <laughs> easy. And also, very anti-frames. Everyone was anti-frames at the time. Yeah, because they were really hard to get to work right Right, then. but now, like mostly it was like a badge of honor. Well, the reason I didn't do it is not because I'm not capable. It's because I don't like them. Well, yeah, that that's when I was in high school. I like learned. I was like, this guy's like, you can do ta use tables and you set them up and they'll look like a frame site. But it's much easier. I thought <laughs> I was like tables with like text and pictures. And now there's on like everything. style sheets. I don't oh, know yeah, anything yeah, about it. Are. No, I, I literally designed the website for my high school in 1999, and I did it in Microsoft Front Page. Nice. I don't know that I'd know how to design a website right now. Well, like if you said, Dave, I need you to design a website. It's easier and harder. Back then, you had to have, like, technical knowledge to make it, like, at all. Right. But now, anybody can make one that looks way better than that just using, like, WordPress or uh, one of those sites out there, like, Squarespace. We're not sponsored, so I'm not going to mention yeah. their name. But, like, WordPress, you can go get a template. You could buy one that a yeah, lot of people yeah. have to use, and all you do is, like, edit the stuff. But if you actually know, like, the programming language, not really programming language which you know what i mean yeah yeah like um, the html but whatever they use these days yeah like you set up your css your style sheets and all those kind of things you can make them look even better so it is easier but it's also harder to make like one to make yours your that'll stand yeah. out yeah yeah I, I remember doing that i remember needing 
it's crazy to think about now because I was just a student. Uh, we were in a program um, where we were trained by a place in Summit County. It was the 6th District Educational Compact, so Stowe was a part of that. Okay. Um, but it was called TWE Technical Work Experience. So we would get training, and then we would basically be the IT staff. We had one faculty advisor, and then we were the IT staff for the school. The whole staff? We Pretty much. Because this was, this was mostly it was, I can't get this p- to print. And they were all Macs, so they were very easy to get to print. But this is no offense, and I hope none of my English teachers from high school are listening. Or if you are an ing- English teacher currently, I hope you're smarter than you were in 1999. Uh, <laughs> English teachers in 1999 could not get Macs to print for shit. Like, they could just not get it figured out. And it's like you had to plug it in. You had to select the printer, and then the Apple Laser Bubble Jet 2 would print it. But it was... I, so, I yeah. But imagine today I that, just was going to say, I don't want to blow your mind or the people listening's mind, but that was 20 years ago. I know. <laughs> it was 20 years ago. But imagine today that that an advisor at a school goes, hey, high school senior, here's the... Uh, Here's the login for the countywide educational FTP site for our entire school district. Here you go. Upload whatever site you want. And I just kind of did it. Um, okay, so I have a similar situation. I actually went to Hoban and Akron, and I was four years behind you, I believe, then, since you were 99. Yes. I was 2003. And we are – the website development classes that you took one of your assignments was you would update the school's website so they had like the main page and then like all the individual pages were made by students and apparently this caused a problem because there was a very a huge degree of how good people were at making (laughs) websites so there were some pages that were updated and looked really good like let's say girls basketball looked professionally done not professionally but looked pretty good the stats the roster on there and then you would have like boys baseball and the names are like all over the page. <laughs> the picture doesn't look right. So eventually they're like, we have to hire somebody to do this. See, that was my problem. And I will be the first to admit it. I had the technical know-how to do it and I could navigate getting it hosted, getting all the pages to work right. Design. I, I'm not good at that. I ha- I need yeah. to contact somebody about that. So, yeah. We also had a thing where in the library, the administrator computer, like where the teacher would sit would could access every person's screen nice and so after school kids would be like working on stuff there and i would sneak in there and i would put messages on people's screen i actually got detention for this before (laughs) there's this one kid who was always annoying people in there and i would put (laughs) he was a huge star trek fan and this isn't even funny but i would type stuff like star trek sucks (laughs) on his computer and it would just pop up and he would be like hey so uh i two of the other guys uh, who were in this, and um, I still know both of them. Uh, we would, first two periods of the day, we didn't have anything. But since I left after lunch to go to Akron, I couldn't get late arrival because they required you to mm-hmm. actually show up for a while. So the first two periods of the day, I'd have to show up, sign into the library to prove I wasn't tardy to school. Then I would go to the library computer lab, and I'd say, oh, yeah, I'm working on the website. Nice. And then the other two guys would come in, and we set up Warcraft 2 to play networked Warcraft 2 against each other. And then every once in a while, a class would come in, and we'd have to pretend like we were working and stuff like that. But we installed... These were all Macs in the pre-OS yep, 10 days. Yep. And so we installed a program on just one machine, because it was a, a, apparently a little more complicated... So we installed it. You could make it pop up an error message. On uh, It's similar to what you were doing, but it looked like a very, very specific error message. Like, okay. So the one uh, stock one was computer uh, monitor radiation level high <laughs> or something like that. And so we decided to mess with that one time. There's a freshman English class in there, and we just – it was the only computer that had it on there, so we didn't even know who was going to sit there. We didn't know the kid, but – we pop up this message and we hear, 
I don't remember what the teacher's name was. But, oh, Mrs. So and So, can you come look at this? <laughs> and then she went over there. Uh, uh, David, could you come take a look at this, please? <laughs> and I went. Oh, oh, and I and I, you know, faked tap 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 tap. And oh, I got it. That's fine. And then we went back to what we were doing. But it was, yeah, they I, can't get things to print for shit. Kids, kids, then are probably the same as now. They're a bunch of snitches. Yeah, so that's. On that, we weren't allowed to download stuff, but if you went on the main computer, you could let a certain computer do it. So one day we downloaded, it must have been the free trial version of like Counter Strike. Yeah. And this was in 2003, so it had been Windows XP because they were Windows at that point. And we were all, there was like 22 kids playing this huge linked game awesome. after school. And somebody comes in and they said, Oh, who did this? Who who downloaded the game? And instead of everybody being like, oh, we don't know. Like, it was just here. Yeah. Every, I was like, this was just on here. We thought it was okay to play because they were downloaded. Some kid snitched me out. And then every other kid in there was like, yeah, it was him. Ugh. That's ridiculous. See, that was my favorite era because you could down, like, the Warcraft 2. We had one copy of Warcraft 2. We installed it on oh, all yeah, three of them. This. Yeah, and we just put the crack on there. That's the other thing that's unbelievable. Oh, cracks. Be- I forgot about those. <laughs> well, we were all we all had administrative access because we were all in this program. Oh yeah, now yeah, IT department. Yeah, exactly. Now it's been twenty years, so I think the statute of limitations, and I'm not going to mention any names in this. The best thing that ever happened is this was the first time that teachers had gotten email through the school problem was their their name was whatever their name was at woodridge dot summit (laughs) summit dot oh dot k12 dot woodridge or something so it was a terrible email address but some teachers would use that as their personal email addresses now they were all assigned the word password as their password and instructed by not the dumb high school kids but by the faculty advisor change your password And very few of them did. And I read a lot of teachers' emails because... Steamy stuff? Not too steamy. Um, Like, I wish it was more steamy than it was. But, like, the one was... A lot of it... One was just the the teacher saying, Hey, where were you Friday night? We were supposed to meet. But as George Thurgood said, I drank alone. I'm like, ah, it could have gotten steamy, but... yeah. I don't know if we ever sent any emails as anybody that we should. That I don't think we ever got that. Uh, did we um, mischievous? Do we ever talk on this podcast about how horrible Woodridge High School's fight song is? Yes, we'll we win did. If we try, I, th- I think we've talked about this too. That I have a theory that your uncle wrote it. Oh, the words. Should I ask him? <laughs> I would ask him because it's right. been again. It's been twenty years it's since a that late too. To text yeah, right I now. don't text him now. Well, this will be a follow up episode. Okay, <laughs> but I forgot you did say that before because it's the it's the same as the University of Arizona is the 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 so he plagiarized the, the tune. The tune was there before he got gotcha. there. It's been with the school for a while. I'm pretty sure he wrote the lyrics himself, which I'm going to recite. We've done it on this podcast before, but I'm going to do it now. <laughs> Let's go, Woodridge High School. We'll win if we try. Fight on, Woodridge High School, with maroon and white held high. And here's the line where I think he wrote it. Okay. Our bulldogs are out to get you. (laughs) So look out every foe. Maroon and white, fight, 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 fight. Woodridge High School, let's go. The bulldogs are out to get you is where I think... He may because it did not have words and it was it was a lot of fun because it was perfect for when the football team was good. And my junior year, the football team was good. It's the only year that they were ever good. They'd score a touchdown. You'd play the fight song then because you had to get quiet when they're going to kick the extra point. It timed out perfectly that you'd kick the extra point while we were singing. So you'd play the fight song at full volume. Everybody's celebrating all that. And then they go to line up for the extra point, And then it's just a bunch of teenagers singing. So it's not that loud. It's not distracting the kicker. Mm-hmm. Then by that time, they kick the extra point. It's a fight song. Singing is over. You play it again at full volume. It was perfectly timed. It was a lot of fun to sing it. It's pretty catchy tuned. Yeah. 
I mean, I I went as a younger kid, and I remember just fight on. Uh, we'll do high school. We'll win if oh, we try. try. Oh, the next part's fight yeah, on. Fight on. Yeah, fight on. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah, just like uh, the Cavs. Like, hey, or no, it's the got to make it happen. It was the not that one. It, that's great, but the one Indians rally song where it's like it's a lot of fun when they win. <laughs> My favorite thing about the Cavs, come on Cavs song, is it's like they handed the guy, he's like, here, here are some basketball terms in case you've never watched basketball before. It's like, with your fast break oh. action. I mean, you know how they recorded that, right? Mm-mm. They basically just rented out a recording studio with like, we need to make a song and did it like that night. Which it's a good song. Because like in that recording studio, there was the instrument that goes... <sighs> Like, <laughs> but like, I like that at that era, there was one of those <laughs> things in there. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, here it is. You do that really good. Thanks. Um. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of right now. We it, always sweep the boards. The <laughs> the Indian song I'm thinking of, it says like, um, it's the way we feel when we win. <laughs> Indians fever. It's just basically oh, saying yeah. like how bad they are. But when they do win and you're there, yeah, it's quite fun. It's like winning the lottery. I will uh, hearken back to uh, the Friday fumble uh, that happened during, uh, I'm going to say it was 2016, that the Browns were terrible. And I did an intro like I was going to do a, a Friday fumble episode. And then I just played talking tribe for an hour that was a great episode but i wanted it i wanted it to be like i wanted it to show up in people's feeds as it was still like 48 minutes long so i just copied it for 48 minutes and i don't know whether i should have been more offended that people were like oh yeah that's my favorite episode because they liked the joke or because there wasn't 40 minutes of our real jokes in there i think a lot of people really like that song because they used to play it on channel 43 Oh, yeah. In the 90s all the time. We're talking baseball. We're talking tribe. That riff. (laughs) (laughs) The best part of that is like during the 90s, with both the Cavs and the Indians, they were both really good teams. But like when the contracts were picked up by WUAB Channel 43, not a big channel in Cleveland. Yeah. It was like nothing. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, these are both nationally competitive teams who play on Channel 43. They're both <laughs> competitors. Right. Or uh, title competitors in their respective sports. It's like all the ads that the Cavs sold at uh, the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse while LeBron was gone. Yeah. And then, oh, now while the most watched athlete in the world is playing, there's an Ollie's discount outlet <laughs> sign that you could see. <laughs> Yeah, I it's about like that. the it's like in Major League Two when he had to sell a bunch of crappy ads on the the. It's like oh, you bought in when <laughs> <laughs> when our big star was Jarrett Jack. <laughs> That's when you you bought your five year ad plan. Oh uh, yeah, when when Kyrie Irving had broken his hand punching <laughs> a uh, pad and people thought his career might, he's just going to be injured from now. He's on. injury prone, yeah. obviously. Well, he's uh, Brooklyn's problem now. I'm fine with that. I'm I'm beyond fine. Hey, if anybody's listening, honestly, if you still made it to this far in the episode, I don't even know where we're at. Yeah. I will send you free of charge. I'm trying to get rid of them. I have a maroon Kyrie Irving uh, Cavs jersey, and I have an orange throwback style Kyrie Irving Cavs jersey. They're both 2X. They're the replica ones, so they're really big. Uh, if you are interested, send me an instant or a direct message at Chris underscore Clem on Twitter, and I I will send it to you free of charge. Free of charge. I want to get deal. rid of it, and if somebody actually wants it, that's a good see. And I I when the Cavs won the championship, I bought. I was up between the Kyrie Irving and the LeBron James, the black jersey with the championship patch I'm on so it. I'm so mad I never got one of those. And I bought. I at the last minute said, you know what? Who am I kidding? Trying to be a hipster with this Kyrie Irving thing. Kyrie Irving's good, but LeBron James is the best player in the world. Yeah. I'm gonna, He's on my team. I'm going to get that. And so I got that, and I still kept it. And I think if it was a Kyrie, 
I would have ditched it. Yeah, I uh, I'm I want them gone. Like I have all my old ones. I got uh, Channing Fry, Kevin Love. Yeah, but I don't want the Kyrie. No, and I I have a pair of Kyrie shoes that I I still have them, but I don't I don't wear them. I should add the orange one. I I've literally worn it once or twice at most it's basically brand new the red one or maroon one it was i got when he was the Cavs' only good player so i wore it for like three seasons right quite a you bit. needed to yeah i have a, a two different varishow jerseys nice i i have multiple olgowski jerseys but he's one of my favorite players well yeah well varishow's one of my favorite players still i like i don't hold the last year of his career against him because he got traded i have two kevin love jerseys i got one where he got traded to the Cavs, and then when the Cavs got new jerseys i was like well who else am i gonna get so yeah I yeah didn't i give you a knockoff kevin love jersey uh lebron oh okay yeah the kevin love didn't fit anybody that was the one my my wife has been uh wears nice <laughs> And I got a Channing Fry. I feel bad jersey. that your wife has the same body shape as me. <laughs> no, it, it fits though. <laughs> I it's like I mean I could those wear it, seat, but I have no, a bunch it is, of other no because I gave it to you because it was way small. So yeah. anyway, that not no body shaming issues it anywhere. It doesn't but, matter. But the point is, like jerseys can be big, but if they're too small, you can't wear them. Well, and especially these were the definitely the Chinese knockoff jerseys with the least stretchable fabric in the universe. Like, it may have well just been canvas. Like, I, it was not a stretchable jersey. She would wear one of my old jerseys anyways, but I have so many that it was like, you. this is just yours now. I have, uh, yeah, I have uh, white, um, uh, first LeBron era, white Verjao jersey, and then I have a, a maroon with the yellow Cleveland Verjao jersey. I just got a Larry Nance Jr., one of the city editions. I really wanted the ice one, but yeah. they did not have it. But then this was half off. And, you know, people were saying how bad they look, but I wear uh, in person, I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, and I, I, I attempted at the time, and I, we pro I think we talked about this. I tried to get one, and it just, whatever combination of things in my cart just didn't work. Yeah. And, like, it wouldn't do, like, the one hoodie that I want didn't apply to the buy one, get one promotion and we it was at the last game of the yeah. year and but then i found oh well you can do it online then i found it online but then they didn't have the right size online and then they had the right size in the wrong color and i'm like ah whatever i'll get it tomorrow and then they ended the 50 percent off thing and this is something that also it was summer so i'm like yeah. i don't need a hoodie we were talking about this not on the podcast for <laughs> sure and because it was with when we were at the game and i think it might have even been your friend uh Dan Holmes shout out second time uh who asked me why I didn't want to get a Colin Sexton jersey and I couldn't really figure out why but now I can because I've had I had an Andre Miller jersey because he was my favorite player at the time he got immediately traded I got a yeah. Kyrie Irving jersey and he totally I had two he totally trashed the city afterwards yeah Colin Sexton wasn't good enough for me to take a risk on buying one for him because even if Larry Nance doesn't ever do anything and he is on a different team, he's, he's still, still Larry Nance. Yeah. yeah. He's Larry Nance jr. And he's grew up in Akron. Well, and that's the same thing with my LeBron Jersey that I would, I wouldn't get rid of it because LeBron's still LeBron. Yeah. And he's a bigger part of the 2016 Cavs because of his whole from here thing that, yeah. And even the thing, and I would never, ever, 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 ever in a thousand years buy any LeBron Lakers stuff because that oh. doesn't apply. But, uh, and the other thing too is like, even though I know he got more money from them than he wouldn't from anybody else, like when Kevin Love re signed, like there's nothing Cleveland fans like more than like somebody coming off an all star appearance, like oh, yeah. I'm re signing. Yeah, absolutely. They should, I, I hope, like, Everyone but the executives of Cleveland keep talking about, well, they're going to trade Kevin Love. But I don't think – I think that's all Bill Simmons nonsense. I don't think it's actually real. I think that he has to be healthy for a whole year before it's even worth trading well, him. yeah. Because what you would get isn't even worth the amount of, like, just having him to try to sell tickets. Unless it's a guaranteed top two pick, then draft picks aren't worth enough. Yeah. Especially for – Let's all be real. The Cavs aren't contending for a championship, so you have to keep the fans happy by keeping the most likable player in the league on your team. If Yeah, I mean, especially after his Instagram excursions to everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and plus, he always <laughs> is wearing, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin shirts when he's posing for pictures. Now, maybe I won't even get into it. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm just saying. <laughs> awkward subject. Okay, like I follow a lot of people on Instagram. His girlfriend, she's all right. If you really want to get into it, people are like, oh, Sports Illustrated model. You know, she's just not my thing. Whatever. I'm glad because I'm not going to compete with Kevin Love and I'm married. So. Yeah, but, um, you know, lots of, uh, that's the, this is like a complete tangent that really can't even even relate to sports because we could at least be like, well, video games are esports. But <laughs> I think. We'll get back to esports in a second. The stratification of nowadays of the way the media works and people's interests, likes, and desires means that nothing will ever be a universal accepted standard ever again. I agree with that. And you can just take what I'm saying, because I'm not trying to get into like adult subject matter, but even like the type of person you're attracted to, the way they look, the things you listen to, whatever, there's no more. um, Maybe Tom Hanks. Maybe, but I don't know. But even that. who? What are the younger people even known? Yeah, because they saw him as the conductor in uh, Polar Express, and they hate him. So, yeah, you're right. But it's not like before when people would be like, oh, this is the it model, or this is like the people's sexiest man alive. Like, right. if I have a specific thing that I like, in a second I can find it, whether that's a book, a video game, or a type of way a woman looks or something. Well, at this point, the the 25%. There's 25% of people who will instantly like the opposite thing that the other 25% just because that 25% likes it. That's true. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I will say, going back to your topic of esports, just not into them. Can't I, do it. Uh, and I just told you I would watch a YouTube video of somebody playing through full throttle. I like that. I don't like the idea of watching the competitive games like i can't get into it the nba e-league stuff i don't like whatsoever and the only time i'll ever watch esports is when it's a game i play like smash brothers and be like oh i think i'm good compared to my friends right and then i watch that and i'd be like oh those guys would beat me within four seconds but then it gets into a thing like if you've ever watched old videos of korean guys playing starcraft and basically they know They've studied the game enough to know not the exploits, but okay, this is the winning strategy, yeah. and I just have to be able to click faster than the other guy because I know the constraints of this game, and then it becomes a little bit. Yeah, I, when I say I've watched it, I mean like it's ten minutes of my life just watching like the high level yeah. championship. I'm not interested whatsoever. I just don't care. I find it odd that like right now in this country, as I as a soccer fan. I have trouble like it's it's gaining in popularity. But then like the other day there was competitive cornhole on TV and I'm like, OK, but we can't show another couple of soccer games mm-hmm. like cornhole. I think it comes down. I I play basketball all the time. I still will watch NBA and be like, oh, wow, those guys are so much better than I could be. Yeah, I play Smash Brothers and I watch them on the thing and i'd say wow those guys are way better than i could ever be at this game but for some reason it just doesn't carry over yeah and i i can't fake that kind of interest or passion level with like that's it's kind of why i never could get into like car racing or nascar is i need the rooting interest so like i need a for me personally i need a home team to root for or an underdog to root for and it seems like if like for nascar or like any car racing and be like, well, I just kind of have to randomly pick a guy or pick a guy who like, oh, I love the Home Depot or, <laughs> you know, yeah. but it's like, OK, well, if I'm just randomly picking a guy, do I pick the guy who's good and wins all the time and I'm a front runner? Or do I pick the guy that doesn't really have a chance to win? How do you do that? I think that's a very smart point, And I agree with it 100 percent because um, the only time I because what I'm going to say now. I have to say first, keeping in mind, you agreed with Hitler earlier. I did not agree with Hitler. <laughs> Craig edited my words. To that say was that. deceptively edited by Craig. I just would think, OK, so I could instead of watching this 
guy play Smash Brothers. I could play Smash Brothers and have way more fun immediately. Yeah. And it's like instead of watching an NBA game, I could go play in a basketball game and have way more fun immediately. The problem is it's not that easy for me to get into like a basketball game. But I yeah. think when I actually have my basketball league I play in, I would right. much rather play that than watch an NBA game. Yeah, if there was a game on at the same time as your game, you'd never skip your game. No, unless – it's the Cavs, like, in the finals right. because that's the team I root for, which I don't have at all, like you said, in eSports. So I think it's both of those things combined. Well, and the team – and, like, the Cavs have an eSports team. Yeah, I see. And Rafa. they post about it, and it's just like, no, stop it. Like, spe- the thing that offends me about it is they'll – the Columbus crew also has that. He's a guy who plays FIFA for the Columbus crew. And it's like, okay, but – you're trying to exalt this guy on the and use the same type of terms you use for this guy that's out there busting his ass for 90 minutes running around like the the other day it was 95 degrees and 80 percent humidity and like let's not pretend that this guy is doing anything like these other guys and i just have the reverence for the achievement and I know it takes certain skills to be good at video games, but I think a lot of it's just the time you had to devote. That's true. And and I don't want to make this a political statement, but Here this we go. reeks of like a very uh, Mark Cuban idea. And because the Mavericks were like one of the first teams to have like their sponsored esports and stuff. But I just want to say for all the great ideas he's had in terms of fan interaction and openness with the referees. And great marketing ideas. He also had like a culture of abuse in his organization for years. So like that he didn't do anything about. So maybe not all of his ideas are good. (laughs) Well, and for that reason, I'm out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mitigate the damage. Mitigate it. Mitigate it with your netting, Craig. Yeah. Are you even listening? No, you tuned out when we mentioned Sega Saturn. Yeah. Because you hate Japanese-made consumer products. You've told me that a number of times. Yeah. You've told me the reason. I'm not going to repeat that reason on this podcast. Whew. It's fucked up, man. He said Toshiba? (laughs) I don't think so. Westinghouse, my friend. I only buy American-made electronics. <laughs> he took a hit when Radio Shack went out of business. I know. He's like, listen, I, I bought a Tandy. That's the last computer I'm ever going to buy. <laughs> Till Packard Bell comes back. Do you know how hard it is in 2019 to find a 3.5 megahertz processor? <laughs> They uh, wear out after a while, and you got a word process. When you're typing up insurance documents, that's a lot of work. When you're trying to mitigate some stuff, yeah, it takes some raw horsepower. When you are building a recording studio in your car <laughs> using only American-made electronics, <laughs> you better hope Audio-Technica has a warehouse sale. Exactly. Or else you're in trouble. You're going to get the Cleveland Lavaliers. <laughs> that's a pun. <laughs> Must be getting late. Yep. Well, uh, I would love to just sit here and talk, but I think we're at a very long uh, amount is, of is time. Is anybody listening? Remember, I said you could have a free jersey. Just send me a message. Just send him a message. I'll tweet about it, too. Um, yeah, uh, if you are listening, thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you soon to get an update to see whether Chris's uncle wrote the Woodridge High School fight song lyrics. A lot of people send messages saying they like this show better than Craig's shows. Not not to brag. If, if you're you guys, one of those people, man, tweet it at if, us, man. If you guys hate this one, just uh, you can still send it to me. Just don't send that in the DM. Yeah, that that in the DM. But if you'd like it, hey man, at Democo at Chris underscore Clem, uh, or uh, at WFNYCLE. Just shout it out that you love the Chris Clem Dave Sterling podcasts. And what are we, we, Dave and Chris talking stuff? Yeah, I'm. I, I have to come up with a witty title, and it's late, so it should be pretty good. All right, everybody, thank you for listening. My name is Dave. This is Chris. It's been the Waiting for Next Year. Dot com podcast. Something's wrong with me.